Welcome, uh, everybody. Good morning. Uh, this is our first keynote of the day. Uh, we're going to be talking about the connected age um, and results over activity, which is something that's near and dear to our heart um, and my heart specifically at Phenom. Uh, as we get started here, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself uh, so that you got some context of where this is coming from. Uh, I started Phenom Blue about 11 years ago. I serve as the CEO of the organization. Uh, Phenom Blue is a connected communications firm. Uh, we specialize in strategic um, consulting as well as high-level creative uh, executions. Uh, from an agency perspective, we work with a lot of different types of brands. Um, we also uh, are featured in Wired, uh, magazines, awards, all that kind of stuff. I'll just get on to the content. <laughs> We've got a uh, few things to cover here. Uh, first and foremost, we're going to talk about the post-digital connected age, um, which is uh, sort of how we define the landscape uh, that exists today. And we're going to uh, dive into that a little bit. Second of all is we're going to talk about results over activity, um, which is a, a theme uh, that we strongly um, sort of believe in and talk to our clients about um, in regards to the connected age. We're going to go through plan, transcend, and succeed. We're going to talk a little bit about a planning part um, and, and really dig into just one piece of sort of the area that, that we focus on. And then we'll talk about some next steps. So when we talk about the post-digital connected age, uh, where I like to start is sort of from, from the lens or the, the context of, of where we started. So in 2004, when Phenom Blue started, about 5% of uh, agency spend was digital. Um, as the industry evolved and years went on, right, and, and anybody who's been around in this business for a while knows, digital has become a much bigger part of, of what we all do. Um, and so if you look at 2009, 10, 11, 12, some of the last few years, in addition to now where digital spend has sort of leaped over 60% uh, of most agency revenue, uh, it's become part of everything, right? And so when we think about the connected world, uh, we kind of look at it as, these new technologies came into place uh, from a digital perspective, um, which created all these brand new uh, expectations for users, right? The, the different technologies drove all these new behaviors. Um, and ulti ultimately, what changed is how people interact, right? All these new behaviors from person to person, how they interact with information, people around them, um, and that sort of thing. And so we lived in this, tradi this traditional world. We sort of transitioned into digital. Now we're in this connected space. Um, in this connected space, the way we kind of see it is that digital is not a silo. Um, it's not a channel. It's the way that people behave. And so if you think about how you interact with, um, with folks um, and how you uh, interact with information and everything around you. It's in these tiny little niche interaction models that are specific to the to the the context that 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 you're in. So the example I like to use is that when I started way back in the day doing uh, doing work and I and I worked at an organization. If the CEO of the organization sent an email out, um, there was probably close to 95, 100 percent of the people that would instantly stop what they were doing and read that email. Uh, and the reality is today, uh, that's a much smaller number. Uh, the reason for that is that people don't want to be told when to read information. They want to be alerted that information that's important exists. Um, and then they will look at it as it fits into their particular uh, contextual version of what importance is. And that's a learned behavior that was driven uh, by cell phones um, and the way that cell phones uh, use alerts, right? Um, so again, these hyper-relevant expectations um, around information and, and, and behavior uh, create these niche kind of interaction models. So when we're talking to clients, we've sort of eliminated a couple different words that we use, which is advertising and marketing, and look at it like it's all just brand building. Right? Every time there is an, an interactive experience, somebody has an experience with something, it's a chance to build your brand both negatively um, or, positive, uh, or positively. Um, and every experience matters. Right? You, you have to worry about everything. And so a way to sort of digest that into kind of the way we work with clients and how, and how, and how businesses have been affected by this connected age, right? Because if you're a client or a, a business out in the world and you're, and you're saying, what does the connected age mean to me? When you think about that, you have to look at it, um, how it affects your organization. And I think that's the challenge that exists for agencies, uh, uh, consulting firms, connected communications firms, companies uh, alike, is that we used to live in this marketing advertising world, right? And, and maybe you were one of those folks who had brand 
um, that was also part of it. Um, but ultimately now you have to worry about communications, right? So lots of companies have corporate communications groups that, that sort of encompass all of that stuff. And then you've got operations because now you have to worry about employees and are they connected to the brand? Are they having the experiences that you want them to have? What about our vendors? What about our partners? And ultimately HR, right? How are we recruiting? How, what messages are we using to tell people why we're important, right? Because a lot of those messages bleed over. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, is the CEO. So I don't think there's been a time in the last 11 years that, that, uh, that we've been in this business um, that we've seen that top tier C-level group so engaged um, in trying to understand why it's valuable uh, to care about these brand experiences and what they mean uh, fiscally, operationally, and sort of bottom line to organizations. Um, before it was, it was very much that's a marketing and advertising thing. Well, now the scope is just much, much bigger. And so when you think about that, really, it's a shift from marketplace challenges, right, which is what we worry about with marketing and advertising, to these universal challenges, right? These are challenges that span all these areas and affect an entire organization or, or a client as a whole. So there's several of these that you, that you can look at uh, in the world and sort of pick as examples to talk about, but we like to sort of look at five of those. Uh, the first one is creative from strategy. Right? A lot of the creative that's existed or a lot of the agency relationships that clients have and, and have had for a while were strictly built on creative based on that agency's experience or what that agency was bringing to the table. If you can think about being a creative director uh, you know, over the last you know, 60 years, a lot of it is gut. I did this before. I've had successes. This is what I think. You try something, it doesn't work. I get fired. I find a new client. You find a new agency. That's the world we live in. The reality is that our behavior has changed, and now we worry about data, what data told us to do things, right? We're doing it with health, we're doing it with wearables, we're doing it with all these things, and it's driving all this new behavior. And so it's natural that your C-level executives are starting to say, wait a minute, we, we should be able to measure, right, uh, the impact that the brand experiences have on our organization at a bottom line. And that's just something we've never really been forced to, uh, to look at uh, from an activity level. We've looked at are we generating leads? How's our media performing? But why are you invested in that activity? Why did you choose to put resources towards that goal? Those are things we just haven't had to do. Um, and so now there's a movement to put some data behind that, right? Um, and again, nothing, from no uh, nothing comes from nothing. If we don't set goals and we don't put strategy out there, we're not going to get anywhere. Uh, second is focused innovation. So the way that I like to uh, explain this is, is with an example about how employees today want to go beyond just the basic uh, principles or the basic things that you've asked them to do. Um, and so it's about putting a strategy in place that allows them to understand what is the purpose, what is the desired outcome of them being in a role, not necessarily what are the two or three things that they need to do day to day. Because if they execute those things and they don't see any movement or it's not accomplishing what they are interpreting to be uh, the desired outcome of what they need to do, um, then they just won't do anything. Um, and you won't get innovation, you won't get people coming up with new ideas, you won't get those things because they don't understand the whole. Um, and so part of putting a strategic uh, plan together so that people can understand what's happening and aligning tactics to it is that you create this environment where people can connect. They can work cross department. They can work, um, you know, take one idea and mash it up with another one because they understand the desired outcome of what they're trying to do, not just the things that uh, you're sort of grading them on in a day to day. Centralized communication is another universal challenge, right? We've had so much technology. Um, and so much new behavior that was created because of that technology inside of the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the zeitgeist and the pop culture of sort of where we live, in addition to inside companies, uh, that brands have lost sort of a centralized communication hub. If you talk to a lot of companies, they'll, talk, they'll tell you about how technology exists in all these different areas, HR, IT, ops, uh, the, the C-level executives. Uh, we have cl we've had clients that have five or six different communication models inside of their organizations. They're on Skype, they're on Gchat, they're on Twitter, they're on this, they're on that. Um, they're implementing new things like Confluence and, um, and, and all those things. And all those things are brand experiences that should be owned by somebody who owns the brand. And the reality is when they're happening outside of the group, then there's no sort of um, guidance or control over that. And so you don't know whether or not you're creating the right kinds of brand experiences. And so it creates this situation where who owns the brand, right? Because, beca because Technology has made us all much more familiar uh, which, with, with, um, and, uh, and uh, comfortable with putting new technologies in. 
that we don't think twice about going out and, and, and getting a software as a service platform or implementing something ourselves. And so now everybody's an expert, right? Um, and if you don't rein that in, provide people with a vision and a, and a, and a strategy around how you're going to do your communication, you can end up uh, in a situation like that. Um, number four is execution is table stakes, right? We grew up, Phenom did, as a production company, right? And sort of found our way into the strategic space over the last few years. Um, and now what we used to do is commoditized, right? Anybody can make anything. Everybody knows that there's a few guys in their garage that can, that can create something magnificent that is just as great as somebody who has 100 employees that can't even afford to do the work that somebody in their garage can do. So the execution is table stakes. So no longer from a leadership standpoint is it very valuable to bring vendors in and say, we're going to bring a partner in or a vendor in and ask them to help us solve their problem, but I want to see what they've made. Right? Because everybody can make anything, you can find somebody to make things. It's about who knows why you should be making it, what you should be making, um, and, and, and when and how much resources you should be putting behind it, and what kind of business goals you're, you're trying to create. So again, execution is table stakes. There's still a lot of folks that are, that are basing a lot of the decisions on that. And lastly is this results over activity idea. Um, and the best way to explain the results over activity idea is to sort of dive in a little bit deeper and, and talk about uh, some, some examples or just maybe at a higher level what, what we're talking about. So one of, the, one of the key things that I like to use is the CEB's recent uh, poll on uh, what urgent problems did, did these CEOs uh, or C-level executives believe were inhibiting their ability to meet objectives that the organization was set out in front of them in 2015. So they pulled all these heads of corporate communications folks and said, what do you think is going to stop you from doing your job um, in the eyes of what your company expects from you? And number one was employee change fatigue. Number two and three were tied. Number four probably came in tied for third, but it was, it was right there. And what was interesting is if you look down this list, is it's not just a list of one, two, three, and four. It's actually a compounding problem, right? The inability to measure and monitor communications activity, right? Meaning we're not monitoring what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how successful we are at it. Not, and I'm talking about the activity, not sort of like, you know, are we generating leads? The activity that you're doing leads to challenges in prioritizing those communications needs. You don't know what you should or should not be doing. Audience overload, right? Not just your consumer that's getting all kinds of messages all over the place that are inconsistent, but also your internal folks, right? They don't know what to start and stop, and they just sort of give up. And ultimately, right, employee change fatigue. Too much stuff, I don't know what I'm doing, everything starts to fall apart. However, if you look at that in the opposite direction and say, if we have the ability to measure and monitor the communications activity that we've got, we are able to clearly and consistently prioritize our needs. It activates your audience, right? They can jump into the situation and help you figure things out, and your employees become much more effective. And the result of that on the outside of the organization is that your messages are clear and more consistent, and you get that lift that you're looking for. And so when we think about that, and sort of why that's such a huge challenge, right, to do that. It makes so much sense to, to do it, but why it's such a huge challenge. I think we have to look at the fact that there's just so many communications channels in the, in the, in the world that it's an economic problem. Um, we talk a lot about uh, the economics of the connected age at Phenom, um, and a really clear sort of principle to work that out is that if you think about 94% of the U.S., people in the U.S. have over 30,000 meaningful interactions a day. It's about 9 trillion, right? And that's the amount of meaningful interactions per day is spikes um, and compounds uh, every you know, three or four months because there's new things coming in that allow you to have influence over connections using technology. So you have say something on Facebook, it gets posted to something else, it gets spread across three networks, and it gets retweeted and reposted. And all of a sudden, these face-to-face -face conversations we used to have are now having much more impact online. And so if you think about that, right, and look at that as a marketer and say, how do I get engaged in those things? How do I know which channel to pick? Um, what I think is really interesting about it is it's very, very challenging to pick which ones that you should and shouldn't be in. Um, and you can't participate everywhere, right? So even when we started in the digital age um, as, a, as, a, as an agency, there was a lot of new digital channels, but you could pick probably all of them and experiment a little bit in addition to sort of, you know, some of the more traditional channels we had. But today it's impossible. Um, I was having a conversation um, with Frank Cooper, the CMO of, uh, of Pepsi, at a, at a conference. One of the things I thought that, that he said that was really interesting was that there was a time where at Pepsi they could literally say, if we spend more money, we will sell more pop. And today there's just so many channels they can't even do that anymore. 
So when we go talk to clients and we sit in front of them and they're you know, a $100 million company or $150 million company or a $500 million company, and they're saying, well, we're just going to try this and try that and see what works, and we're going to participate over here and participate over there, you can't. Pepsi can't do it. You can't do it. right? And one of the other things is you have to be focused. You have to be deliberate. You have to find effective, efficient methods, and you need a strategy that allows you to succeed before you start investing. right? So this is coming from a person who represents a brand that can pretty much do whatever they want. Um, and, and, and has the dollars to do so. And so if you look back and we think back again about this brand, marketing, communications, operations, HR, CEO sort of model, right? It's not just a, a shift that we talked about before, but it's also a shift from tactical prowess, right, in the marketplace to strategic success. And so if you're a client today or you're a um, or you're an agency or a service provider or a partner in this space, right? We used to talk a lot about tactical prowess, and now we're talking a lot more about strategic success. How do we define it for clients? How do we help them measure whether they are successful? And then how do we help them deliver that, right? It's different. So when we think about how to do that, we talk a lot about strategy and tactics, and those are two totally different things. And I think it's important to define those because when you ask somebody what is strategy, you get a lot of different answers. You get a lot of different answers in the... Uh, agency space as well as kind of the, the you know the consulting space and then if you go talk to different people in different industries you're going to get completely different examples um, and definitions in our case we believe a strategy is the definition of success or a desired outcome so your strategy shouldn't change if it change if your strategy is to have this desired outcome it is not going to change um, I have clients who've come to us and said the problem is we don't have somebody constantly looking at our strategy and deciding how it should change well, if that's your problem, that's a huge problem because no one knows where to aim, right? If you're constantly changing the desired outcome, you're never going to get anywhere. Tactics, however, are those activities that you execute to, execute to achieve the strategy. So you've got the definition of what success is or what the desired outcome is, and then you've got the activities that you're executing to achieve that strategy, right? And you can be really good at doing tactics, right? You can have tactical prowess, but if you don't have strategic success and you don't know how to measure it, you're always going to fail. So what is the desired outcome should be the number one question that you're asking agencies if you're a client and that you're asking your clients if you're an agency, right? Let me give you a really interesting example about desired outcome versus, or tactics versus strategy, right? If you understand the strategy and you understand the desired outcome, you can help go outside the lines of what those tactics are and you can do extra tactics or take the extra step or do different things because you understand what the desired outcome is. You can sort of think for yourself. When it's just a tactic, right, and somebody's lined a bunch of tactics up, you may not hit the desired outcome, and you'll never even know. So one of the examples that I use is we had a client, a really, really, really big client, that has a lot of, that hires a lot of people, spends a lot of money bringing people into the organization, um, has a, had a significant turnover issue, um, and was looking at the problem, right? So we were brought in to say, let's, let's look at all the different experiences somebody has, and let's try to figure this out and try to understand why, why, why this is happening. So we went in and we did you know, a bunch of uh, investigation, discovery, and talked to people and all that kind of stuff. And one of the um, young women that we talked to uh, came to this large company uh, right out of school. It was her first job. And she shows up for her first day, right? She's the new hire. And she goes through the process, right? This tactical process that was designed that involves several work streams, right? And, and if we, you know, we're all familiar with this, this, this sort of process, we've got orientation, we've got HR, we've got security, we've got IT, we've got our manager. So there's all these people sort of engaged in these work streams, right? And they all have tactical steps. So she walks into the lobby the first day and somebody says, hello, welcome. Uh, let me get you a badge, take you to orientation, and orientation takes over and tells her a little bit about the company. Then HR comes in and tells them about their benefits, you know, and uh, ultimately IT comes in and talks to them about their computer. And then, you know, uh, the person from orientation comes back and leads them up to their desk and introduces them to their manager and all that kind of stuff. The problem here, right, is that when this new hire was led up to the desk, the manager wasn't there. So one of the tactical functions broke. Right? And it, who knows? Wasn't there because they forgot? Wasn't there because they weren't alerted? Who knows? But they weren't there. HR person drops off anyway, or orientation person drops off anyway, because, again, finishing the tactic. So in this case, this young woman sat in this cube all day long. No one talked to her. Nobody asked her what's going on. Right? She can't log into her computer yet. She's just sitting there. This is her first job at her big company. 
uh, really smart uh, engineering person, graduated from a very big school, right? And now she doesn't want to go ask anybody for help, starts to become embarrassed. The second day, she comes in and she just goes and sits in a conference room. So day two goes by, sitting in a conference room, doesn't want to leave, doesn't want to ask anybody for help. Day three comes, she shuts the light off in the conference room because she's now at a point where she doesn't know what to do. Finally, day four, somebody comes in and says, can I help you, right? So here, she's sat for four days and no one's helped her. Now, now tactically, there was a lot of work streams set up and there was a lot of tactics laid out there, but the desired outcome of what this team really should worry about is that she felt well adapted and well oriented to her team, stopped this from happening. Right? And so in this case, the company that we were working with was really hardcore and stressing kind of the tactical outcomes of what was necessary and really harping on identifying all the steps and making sure that each work stream was involved. But they didn't spend enough time helping people understand the desired outcome and why it was so important and what this person should feel like and all this other sort of stuff um, that you have to look at from a strategic standpoint that would have stopped this from happening. Somebody would have went beyond. They would have saw that the manager wasn't there and maybe said, I'm not going to leave until this person makes this introduction, right? Not just make some, some assumptions. So that's just sort of a real world example. So when we talk about uh, kind of a process for that, right? How do we avoid that? Um, one of the things that, that we've developed is, is a platform. Um, and, and part of that platform is a, a three-step process called Plan, Transcend, and Succeed. And so in these three-step processes, we sort of broke down the, the three main areas or three main silos that you have to walk through to successfully set out a strategy, successfully pick the tactics that are efficient and effective there, and then to execute those. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit today is just sort of the plan piece. It's a, it's a, it's a bigger deal, and, 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 and you're welcome to reach out and talk to us about it, but it's a, it's a, little, it's a, it's a big deal. So I'm going to talk about the plan piece because I think that's probably the most important piece um, on the front end and the most interesting uh, because there's not a lot of folks that sort of take that, uh, take that step. So, you know, I like to use Peter Drucker's uh, quote here, there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently uh, that which should not be done at all. Uh, one of the misconceptions about strategic approaches or putting out goals and sort of building big plans is that, well, I don't have the resources to do that, or I don't have the time to do that, or I don't have, you know, it's gonna cost too much money. And the reality is, in most cases, you're probably doing a bunch of stuff today that's inefficient and ineffective, um, and so it's a waste of time. So. By strategic planning, you're actually saving yourself time, making yourself more efficient. So when we talk about strategy, we're talking about a measurable strategy. And in this case, one of the best stories that I think conveys that, um, that sentiment or, 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 or talks about that, um, that idea is Moneyball. Um, if you're not familiar with Moneyball, you will be in a, in a couple minutes. Um, if you have seen the movie or, or heard the story, um, you'll sort of understand here and can follow along. Uh, but uh, Moneyball is about um, a, the, a team, the Oakland Athletics, um, who participate as a Major League Baseball team and, and obviously want to be the best team. Um, but they're hamstrung by their budget, right? So um, this was a season where they sat down and said, all right, our strategy here um, is that we're going to have the best team in Major League Baseball. That's what an owner says to a GM, right? At the beginning of the year, we want to have the best Major League team in baseball. However, in this case, I'm going to give you $75 million less than everybody else to do that. Right, so a more clarified strategy, right? Because everybody's saying we want to be the best team in baseball. It's kind of hard. What does best really mean? How am I going to measure that? A more clarified strategy might mean we're going to have the best players, the best leadership, and the best facilities. But still, we just haven't gotten to the point where we can measure. A measurable strategy saying the same thing is we're going to win one more game than our opponents, right? I can sit in a room and start coming up with ideas about how to win one more game than our opponents, and it's very measurable. I'll know if I won. I'll know if I made it happen, and I can tell you whether I was successful or not. Second of all, right, everything's a system. Every system's governed by rules. So in this case, right, the key to ensuring this desired outcome, winning one more game than everyone else, was to look at the system, identify all the rules at play, what can we, what can we manipulate to affect the change that's necessary, and let's focus all of our efforts on only manipulating those rules. And so in baseball, right, the typical system is, we have scouts, they go out and they look at the best players, they uh, say, hey, this player kind of looks like this one that was successful, they have an arm that looks like that, he kind of has a swing that reminds me of another player that's been successful, let's bring that guy into the league, and it's sort of a trial and error approach, right? In this situation, they said, you know, if we're only trying to win one more game, right, then what we need to do is we need to field a team of players that have the highest on-base percentage, because if we get on base, then we will score more runs and we will win games. And that's what they did. 
right? And they were very successful doing that. Um, you can watch the movie, you can read the book. Spoiler alert, they were really good at it, and they um, were one game away, I think, from making the, uh, the World Series. So. so that's kind of the plan, transcend, succeed part from a planning portion. Transcend is about once you have those measurable strategies, right, and you have those measurements, coming up with those ideas that can help make those measurements come true, and then obviously execution and tracking, right? A lot of data uh, important to execute and track. So next steps, takeaways from, from, from this talk. Um, you're gonna hear a lot of conversation today in other, in other sessions about uh, the connected age. You're gonna hear about brand, you're gonna hear about behavior, you're gonna hear about some of these things. Um, I would encourage you to uh, listen to the other, uh, the other sessions and, and, and take some of that stuff back, uh, either to the agency side or to the client side, um, and use it in the future. Um, and a lot of the things you can implement uh, immediately, it's just a, a different sort of way of thinking. Um, specifically in what we're talking about here, um, ask yourself, are your goals for 2015 clearly prioritized, right? I like to ask clients that. A lot of times that's a question where your immediate answer is yes, and then you think about it for a minute and you say no, um, and then you start thinking, I don't know if we have a process for that. That leads to the second question, do we have any results from 2014 we can move into 2015 to even come up with those goals or look beyond, right? Um, a lot of times the answer to that is no. Um, how do you activate your audiences both internally and externally, right? Can't be understated in the connected age how important it is to not just focus on the external things, but also internal, right? Um, employees, uh, vendors, partners, big portion um, of what you're doing um, if you're in the PR marketing space um, as well. So the other thing you can do, uh, we have a report that talks about the five tenants. I mentioned them here. I talked a little bit about them, but it sort of goes more in depth. Um, it's interesting, you can download it from our website for free. I'd go out and check it out. Um, and then lastly, you know, if you wanna know more about the plan, transcend, and succeed process, um, feel free to reach out to us um, and we can provide some more information um, about that process and each of those phases and sort of how we, how we go through things. Um, and my email's on the screen here, so I would encourage anybody to follow up with any questions, any comments, um, I'd be happy to, to take them and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the day.